Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. All right. so apologies for the delay. Uh, I so apologize for that, but thank you for, for all being here. Uh, we know there's a lot of interest today on some uh, international uh, issues out there, so we wanted to make sure that we had someone from NSC. So I brought over John Kirby from uh, uh, NSC. Uh, I, I always mess this up. <laughs> Communication strategy uh, coordinator. Okay, all yours, Kirby. Sorry about that. Thanks, Kirby. No worries. Okay, everybody. Just a couple of the uh, uh, things at the, at the top here um, today. I think, uh, and you may have heard Secretary Blinken talk about this earlier. Officials from the U.S. Embassy in Moscow attended the sixth session of the court hearing of American citizen Brittany Griner, who was being wrongfully detained under intolerable circumstances. I want to reiterate that President Biden has been clear about the need to bring home every American who is held hostage or wrongfully detained abroad. And that includes, of course, Brittany Griner and Paul Whelan. Now, months ago, President Biden directed his national security team to pursue every avenue to bring Brittany home safely to her family, her friends, her loved ones, or teammates. The U.S. government continues to work aggressively, pursuing every avenue to make that happen. Now, as part of those efforts, we made a substantial offer to secure the release of Paul Whelan and Brittany Griner and to bring them home, just as Secretary Blinken mentioned earlier. I would add that a high-level administration official, the Deputy Homeland Security Advisor Josh Geltzer, spoke today, uh, reached out, I'm sorry, today to both uh, the Whelan and Griner families ahead of Secretary Blinken's comments, um, and he's going to be having conversations with them later today and tomorrow as we uh, arrange for them to connect. In order to decrease the chances for success here, we're obviously not going to be able to share more publicly about the deal. I'm sure you all have questions about what this looks like, and I'm sure you can all understand that it's not going to help us get them home if we're negotiating in public with you all. So I'm not going to have any more detail on that. But I will say that the President and his team are willing to take extraordinary steps to bring our people home, as we've demonstrated with Trevor Reed. And that's what we're doing right here. It's actively happening now. now. This has been at the top of the mind for the President and for his whole national security team. He receives regular updates about the status of our negotiations to secure Brittany and Paul's release, as well uh, as other U.S. nationals who are wrongfully detained or held hostage in Russia, and I might add, around the world as well. With that, take some questions. Okay. A few questions for you, Kirby. Just want to make sure, one, this offer was made in June, is that right? It was made several weeks ago. Several weeks ago. And has Russia responded to the offer? And, and our indication seems to be that they have not. And if they have not responded, what do you read into that? Again, I don't want to get into the details of negotiations, Caitlin. I would tell you that uh, the, the offer has been uh, been made, um, and uh, and uh, we certainly hope that uh, that Russia will uh, favorably engage on it. But I, I I don't want to get into more detail about that. If they haven't favorably engaged so far, do you think this is an offer that President Biden needs to make directly? I think we're making it clear across the national security team uh, that we're serious about securing their release. I don't have any conversations uh, to speak about or announce on the, on the President's behalf. Uh, we believe that this is a serious proposal, and we want the Russians to take it seriously as well. You talk about Brittany Griner and Paul Whelan being a part of this substantial, serious offer, as you describe it. There are other questions being asked about why Mark Vogel is not included among those names. He's a former diplomat who was a, a teacher at the Anglo-American School of Moscow. Can you explain why he is not a part of this list of Americans that are a part of this exchange? I, again, I don't want to talk specifically about what the, the modalities of the deal, as you mentioned the word exchange. I'm just not going to get into the details of it, but, but I would just tell you we're, we're focused on all Americans who are held hostage and wrongfully detained around the world. That the, the, what, what, we, what we're talking about with this particular proposal is, uh, is for those two individuals. That doesn't mean that we're not also working in real time on other Americans who are unjustly detained around the world. Can you explain why he then is not a part of this I, one? I think I'm just going to leave my comments where they are, Peter. Okay. Yeah. Um, is there a risk in announcing this deal and making this deal public? Uh, there's. This is delicate work um, uh, to try to negotiate for someone's release. And every case is individual. 
the circumstances of their detention is unique. The circumstances of of uh, of how they're being held and under what uh, you know under what legal basis is all unique. And of course, um, our approach then has to be unique. We try very hard to be very careful in the public sphere uh, about how much we say. Um, I, I don't want to get into too much today other than to tell you that we felt that where we are and given the, given the circumstances, certainly in, the, in part in context to uh, Ms. Mrs. Greiner having to stand uh, and testify uh, today, um, that, um, that this was, that it was an appropriate time to, to talk about these efforts. But I will tell you that even that decision was not taken lightly. Uh, and we're going to continue in private to work uh, through the negotiations. And I know you can't talk about the details of the deal, but it has been reported that Victor Groove is part of that. Um, he's obviously been called the merchant of death. He's been called the most dangerous man um, on the face of the earth. Is having him part of this deal a good idea? I'm not going to talk about the details of uh, the negotiations and the arrangement that uh, the proposal that we made to the, to the Russians. And again, I think, as I said at the top, I, th I, I hope you all can understand why uh, more detail is just not going to be helpful for, for us right now. Take another crack at that. Has the uh, president made a determination that uh, releasing Victor Boot is in the national security interest of the United States? I'm not going to negotiate this thing in public, and I'm not going to talk about uh, specific individuals. Um, our focus on individuals right now is on getting Mr. Whalen and, and uh, Ms. Griner home, uh, and, and that's where the president's head is. And um, again, we've made a proposal. We uh, we urge uh, the Russians to, to move positively on that proposal so that we can get these two individuals home. The details of it, I think, are best left uh, between us and, and our Russian counterparts. You said that this obviously is a delicate negotiation, delicate work, but the, you decided this was the appropriate time. Why is this the appropriate time to go public with this substantial offer, and are you just trying to up the pressure on Russia by making this public now? Yeah, I think it's sort of the same answer I just gave. There, there's a, no decision to talk about these issues uh, are made lightly, given how sensitive they can be and given the ultimate outcome that you want to achieve. Uh, uh, we, we think through every step so carefully, um, and I can just promise you that uh, that this decision was that this decision to talk about it was was made in the in the same vein and in the context of what's going on with both cases and what's going on wh where we are in the negotiations, and uh, we just felt like it was an appropriate thing to do, again with limits. I mean, we're we're only going to go so far here. And more, more broadly, if I could, you know, after Trevor Reed's release, the president did talk about what a difficult decision that was uh, and how he didn't take it lightly. Could you just talk broadly, as how does the president evaluate when a prisoner swap is worth it? There's a range of things that the, the president and the whole team have to, have to balance here. I mean, ultimately, your goal is to get Americans that are unjustly detained and held hostage home, back to their families where they belong, back on their home, home soil. That's the overarching goal. You start with that, and then you start thinking through the building blocks of what's it going to take. And every case is different, every single one, uh, because of different legal systems where they're held, different conditions under which they're held, different governments that you're dealing with, whether uh, what their relationship is bilaterally between you pick the country you're talking to, all of that factors into it. Um, and the, the team presents the president the whole range uh, of options uh, for him to, to work his way through there. Um, but I can assure you that in his mind, as I said at the top, the foremost in his mind is getting these Americans home. And obviously there's, as I said, there's a balance to be achieved with each and every arrangement. Um, and uh, the balance of getting folks home, but also making sure that our own national security is preserved, uh, and the clearly that we're not encouraging hostage taking in the future. Um, and you, you can go back and look, look at any case and, and see that you know uh, it, it's very rare that any one case is is all lopsided on one way or the other. But the goal has got to be to to try to find a way to get them home, and that's his focus. Good job. Uh, 
Kirby, we were reporting that the call with President Xi and President Biden has been set for tomorrow. Is there anything you can share about whether that time has been set and preview any of the call at all for us? Uh, I, I can't announce a, a date and a time for you. Uh, I think the President spoke to this just the other day that he expects to do this very soon, and I think it will be cer certainly uh, uh, very soon in coming days. But I, I, I wouldn't get more specific than That's that well. for you. Um, hang on. He had a second question. Um, uh, I'm not going to get too far ahead of uh, a conversation that the President's having with uh, another head of state, except to say there is an awful lot in the bilateral relationship between the United States and China for these two leaders to talk about. And this, I think, will be their fifth call. So it's not like they haven't had communications. And that's the key thing, is that the President wants to make sure that the lines of communication with President Xi remain open, because they need to. Um, that there's issues where we can cooperate with China on, and then there's issues where, obviously, there's friction and tension. All of that uh, will, uh, I, I would expect the President uh, uh, to bring up in, inside this. So clearly, tensions over, uh, over Taiwan, uh, tensions over uh, Russia's, I'm sorry, China's uh, uh, aggressive and coercive behavior in the Indo-Pacific outside of Taiwan, tensions in, in the economic relationship, um, uh, Russia's unprovoked war in Ukraine. I mean, I, I would expect all these things to be to, to be part and parcel of the conversation. I'm sorry, I know you've been asked this question like 100 times in the last two days. Let's it make it 101. It was, yeah, it was reported today that Speaker Pelosi invited other members of Congress to Taiwan on a potential trip. Do you have any update for us on what uh, information the administration has given to the Speaker's office? You said yesterday, if I recall correctly, the information had been provided in recent days. Yeah. Has there been any update to that, or do you have any comment on the potential for Speaker Pelosi to? Make a stop. I, I actually, with other members of Congress. Yeah, I don't. I don't have much to satisfy you today. I mean, first of all, I'm not going to speak to Speaker Pelosi's travel. That's really for her and her staff to speak to. And there's been no announcement, as far as I know, no decision made. So that's a really a better question put to to the Speaker and her team. I will tell you that uh, it's routine for us to when she travels overseas uh, to provide her facts and analysis, context. Uh, geopolitical realities that she's going to be facing uh, wherever she goes. And there's always uh, uh, issues of security surrounded uh, uh, by, by her travel, too, that sometimes the Department of Defense participates in, depending on where she goes um, and how long she's going to stay and what the, what, you know, what the threats and challenges are. Um, and we, we do that routinely. Uh, and, and that's really what our focus is on here. The speaker will make her own decisions. Yeah, um, in Europe, they are talking about conserving uh, natural gas for fear of Russia cutting off supplies this winter. They're developing these yeah. plans. Um, where do things stand with U.S. efforts or global efforts to supply alternative yeah. sources of natural gas? I realize it's August and it's a million degrees, but it will be winter soon. It's a million degrees in here, too. <laughs> um, yeah, I. I think you know, I think Kareem's talked to you about the task force that the President stood up to, to work with uh, suppliers and distributors around the world to see if we can't find alternative sources for natural gas and, frankly, for uh, oil for uh, our European allies and partners, and that work continues. Um, this, this is just another example of Mr. Putin weaponizing now energy as he's weaponized food. Um, uh, and we're going to work as hard as we can. I don't have a specific update for you today, but we're going to work. But we're not going to work as hard as we can to make sure, uh, in the context of the president's task force, that we are trying to find alternative sources uh, for our European and allies and, uh, and partners as they, you know, face uh, a frigid winter here. We understand. We understand uh, the realities of that and the impact that that's going to have on their lives and livelihoods. About the economy, or are we doing? I'll, I'll, I'll come okay, in. correct. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be at the podium once Kirby's done. Yes, yesterday, state of the Union officials say they could say China's behavior on the South China Sea. They say the uh, China's aggressive behavior means it's only a matter of when before major accident happen. So, how are you concerned about China's behavior in the South China Sea? And do you expect the president will talk about the issue with the president Sea? I, I, uh, I would fully expect that, as part of the President's conversation, that um, tensions in the South China Sea will, will come up, as they have routinely uh, with respect to China's uh, excessive maritime claims um, that aren't backed up by international law, uh, by their coercive and aggressive behavior towards, uh, towards nations that, that border 
on the, the sea or are in the South China Sea. Um, and, uh, and I fully expect that that will, that will come up. Yeah. Alex and Crystal. John, uh, back to the, the speaker's uh, potential travel. Uh, it, it's well known that the Chinese have leveled threats, saying there'd be severe consequences. What would the president say to that, given that it's, it's assured that's going to come up? I'm not going to get ahead of the president's call with President Xi, I, and I certainly wouldn't uh, detail here for you his specific points on any one issue. I want uh, to go there. Follow up. Uh, Axios is reporting that uh, Brett McGurk told a, a think tank uh, last week that it's highly unlikely that the uh, Iran nuclear deal will be revived. Is that is that is that an accurate statement? I, I, I don't think I'm going to comment on uh, what was uh, what was billed as a private phone call uh, uh, that that uh, Mr. McGurk uh, participated in. I would just tell you a couple of things. One, we remain committed to seeing Iran never achieve a nuclear weapons capability. You heard the President say that on our recent trip to the Middle East. Two, that the President believes diplomacy is the best path forward to, to that outcome. Uh, three, that the negotiations are pretty well complete uh, on a new JCPOA, um, and uh, it's on the table, and the onus is now on Iran to decide whether they're going to take that deal or not. And the last thing I'd say is, Short of that, and I don't want to hypothesize, we still hope that they'll come back into compliance, and it's not just us. Our European partners feel the same way. But short of that, the President has an obligation, and you heard him say this on the trip, to make sure he can look after our national security interests in the region, make sure that we have the capability and the capacity to do that, to defend ourselves and to help defend our allies and partners against the range of other Iranian threatening behavior. They're burgeoning ballistic missile capability, which continues to improve, their support for terrorist groups, their threats in the maritime environment. Uh, all of that's still happening, and so we still have uh, a concomitant responsibility to be ready for that, and we will. Um, this question has come up given the uh, golf tournament happening at Bedminster, and it's a question from the 9-11 the families. Does, the, does President Biden plan to meet with the 9-11 families as his predecessors um, have done? I, I don't have anything on the president's schedule with respect to that. I, I, I don't, but I can, we can take the question and see if there's something. I just don't know. Uh, but before I go, I don't want to just blow past that. The, obviously, the, the, the president, uh, just like all Americans, you know, remember that tragic day and continues to want to do everything that we can as an administration to support them. Excuse me if you said this before, but did, did they come up specifically in the, in the Saudi meetings? The president made it clear that, uh, I would just say that, made it clear that, that, that human rights and uh, the defense of, uh, of our national security interests abroad and at home were important to him. Thank you, Kareem. Um, yeah, so I have a question about China and then a question about Saudi Arabia. Um, on China, you, you just mentioned that President Biden intends to bring up South China Sea issues. And I was wondering if we could also expect him to be bringing up um, issues regarding uh, fentanyl exports from China and regarding the origins of COVID-19 as well. I think, as I said, there's going to be a range of issues. We'll give you a full readout after that call is over with. And I, I think I've gone in. I've gone in. I, they are they are big issues. No argument. I think we'll. We'll, uh, we'll give you a readout when the call's over. I don't want to go into any more detail of the call than I just did. Uh, regarding Saudi Arabia, um, President Biden uh, may, have began to have, may have begun to have symptoms about four days after returning from Saudi Arabia. Has the U.S. government ruled out the, uh, the possibility that the Saudi government may have deliberately exposed the president to the coronavirus? I, I, I think I should re refer to Kareen on that question uh, in terms of talking about the president's medical condition that's out of my scope but 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 I I don't know where this idea is coming from I, I don't know what prompted you to ask it that way but the idea that a foreign nation state would would deliberately try to infect the president of the United States with a virus is just ludicrous just absolutely ludicrous there's nothing to it and it should be treated as the as the ridiculous uh, idea that that it is. Admiral, I have a question. Just briefly, I, I, what's your, I, I just want to know what's your Trevor's response yeah, to I'm Russia. Good, yeah. So, um, so um, on Taiwan, um, you mentioned about that will be a topic on the call. Um, where is that situation right now, and where do you expect that it will be after the call? Do you expect there to be some progress or some kind of? new arrangement on that issue? I, I wouldn't, I, I mean, again, I don't want to get ahead of the president. Um, uh, 
so I, I, you know, I, I can't speak to some specific arrangement that might come at, as a result of this. But let me back up a little bit. This is about keeping the lines of communication open with the president of China, one of the most consequential bilateral relationships that we have, not just in that region, but around the world, because it touches so much. Um, and I think the president, I know he's looking forward to this conversation. There's a lot for them to, to, to talk about. Um, uh, clearly, we would expect that that uh, that the tensions over Taiwan would be would be on the uh, would, would be on the agenda. I'm sure, without getting into the you know uh, too far ahead of the president, I'm sure uh, that in one form or another, he will reaffirm that there's n no change to America's commitment to the One China policy, none, zero, and that. Uh, we continue to not want to see um, uh, cross-strait issues or tensions resolved unilaterally, or, and certainly not by force. And there's no reason for it to. Um, but there's no change to our, our one-China policy, and I'm 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 quite certain that the, that the president will uh, will reaffirm that. Um, we're mindful. I mean, it's not like it's not like the president's not mindful of the context here. Um, that there has been rising tensions uh, in and around the Taiwan Strait, uh, and that the Chinese have been more uh, aggressive, the Chinese military. Um, and as you've heard many leaders across the administration say, that's, that's not only not helpful, it's, it's not necessary, because nothing has changed about our one China policy. Okay, and then one other, let me just get one other piece of chips back. Uh, secured Senate report uh, today. That's a China-related um, measure, obviously, um, you know, on, on economic competitiveness. Um, and I'm, I'm curious that, you know, the president uh, already issued a statement of support for what the, the Senate did, but that bill does not include um, uh, a measure that would allow the U.S. to look at what businesses are doing abroad when they're investing in China. That provision was stripped out. Does the White House expect to issue an executive order to fill in that gap? That's a better question for my colleague. All right, just a couple more. Ebony, Sebastian, Tyler. Um, I know you can't give us a minute much details about the negotiations with Ryder and Wheeler. However, was there any conversation with the family of of uh, Whelan or even Reiner's wife before the announcement was made? Has there been any conversation? We have been in constant touch with with uh, with both families uh, about the status of negotiations. So they have been informed every step of the way, um, so that they understand exactly what we're doing on behalf of their loved ones. Uh, there was outreach to both families today uh, in advance of Secretary Blinken's uh, uh, press conference. Um, I don't know that we connected uh, with both of them before that, but there was, a, there was a, certainly a, an effort to do that. And as I said in the opening statement, uh, we'll continue to reach out throughout the rest of the day and, and tomorrow as well. And do they seem satisfied with, um, I know you said not Whelan, but on, with, with Griner's, I don't know whether you spoke with her wife or whether it was her, her mother and the rest of her family, or were they satisfied? What was the sentiment that was said in that conversation? I'm not going to speak for the families. They, they need to speak for themselves. But we have, I, I, I do want to stress again, we have kept them informed every step of the way. Uh, the outreach today was just to let them know, hey, we're going we're gonna to be talking a little bit more uh, about the, the arrangement, but it's part and parcel of a constant contact that we've had with them throughout, and so we've been working real hard to keep them informed. Thank you. Uh, on the Xi call, again, uh, oh, there you have oh, it. Um, thank you for saying my question. On the Xi call, um, you, 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 keep, you keep stressing that the President's, perhaps his main goal is to have the lines of communication open. It's also often been said the president is somebody who likes to have face-to-face uh, -face meetings with, with leaders. I mean, the White House says that all the time. So um, Both are important. Right. So now that COVID is, you know, over, quote-unquote, the president is today. He was in the Rose Garden. Um, is there any plan, or if not plan, is there any desire, is there any talk about an in-person Soviet issue? Because it's something you guys never, it just never gets raised. This is his fifth phone call, right? Yeah, COVID's not over. Um, 
uh, all the time. Right, with all of you. Yeah. And we just came off a very important trip to the Middle East. I don't have a trip uh, to Beijing to uh, to speak to or announce today, and I don't have a visit by President Xi to speak to or announce today. Um, but uh, you know, if and when that that happens, we'll, we'll certainly be able to talk about it. There's certainly no prohibition to it or no policy against it. I mean, this is their fifth conversation. As I said. The, the, this is one of the most consequential bilateral relationships in the world today, um, with ramifications well beyond both individual countries. The president clearly understands that and will continue to work on that relationship. I just don't have a physical face-to-face -face meeting to talk about today. The president never have expressed any frustration, perhaps, about that, that, that this, as you say, is so consequential, there's so many issues, they're so big. That frustration maybe that, about what? That, that he is not getting to see Xi in person and, and hash this stuff out face-to-face. -face. I mean, this is his... This will be his fifth conversation. I don't think I don't think he believes he doesn't have the opportunity to uh, to relay his concerns to President Xi, to listen to President Xi and and his and what his issues are. I mean, I think part and part part of doing this these calls is to keep that communication going. I don't think the president feels like communication between the United States and China is lacking. And it's important to remember that it's not just at his level. I mean, the Defense Secretary, uh, the, the Secretary of State, um, other cabinet officials, uh, Mr. Sullivan uh, clearly works uh, on this relationship very, very hard as well. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's a whole level here of communication with the, with the Chinese. Just, just more on the timing today of Secretary Blinken's announcement on the, the fact that the U.S. had made a deal. Was that in part because, as you said, uh, Russia has not favorably engaged on it? You said it happened many weeks ago. Why was today the day that he would announce? It? Yeah, I, I think um, there's, a, there, there's a, a lot of reasons. And uh, I think you have to just, because um, we don't want to negotiate too much in public, you just, I think the reason we did it today was in context of sort of where things are, where things aren't, um, and certainly, um, you know, this, this next step in, in, her, in her trial. Um, th there was a lot of reasons that, that, that we factored into m making this public today. You say you don't want to negotiate in public, but that's precisely what you're doing. You no. made this announcement today after weeks of secret negotiations to let the public know. Is this part of pressure campaign? Is this? Uh, you said there's many reasons. Can we, you give the American public a sense of what those reasons are? Yeah, yeah. Well, by saying that there's a proposal on the table is not negotiating in public. I would take issue with that. Um, but um, to your uh, to your larger point, uh, we believe it's important um, for the American people. To, uh, to know how hard President Biden is working to get Brittany Griner and Paul Whelan home. We think it's important uh, for their families to know how hard we're, we're working on this. Um, and we think, um, we think making it clear that there is, actual, there is an actual proposal made, that there, that there is something tangible on the table, uh, is important context uh, for the world to know. Uh, that uh, about the United States uh, seriousness with which we will which we will try to get our, our citizens back home. I mean, there's a lot there, Tyler. I, I I couldn't point to like one thing and say this is what made it happen today. There's an awful lot going on inside the context of uh, of the work to get them home, and we felt that um, that letting everybody know, not just the American people, but the whole world, that, um, that there's a proposal, um, and we're and we're we're we're, we're waiting on Russia to, to make a decision. Yeah, thanks, Corrine. I just want to clarify, John, is it the White House's position that Nancy Pelosi should or should not go to Taiwan? The Secretary, I'm sorry, the Speaker of the House makes her own decisions about travel. We provide facts, context, analysis, geopolitical realities for, uh, that she'll be facing wherever she goes. Our job is to inform her decision-making process, and we're doing that. The Speaker makes the decisions. But why wouldn't the White House make a public position on this? It's such a, would be such an important, significant trip. Uh, we, we typically don't, though. I mean, when, when wh wherever the speaker goes and whenever she goes overseas, I mean, this, is the, this is exactly the way it works. It's, we, it's we, don't, we don't make it a habit of, of speaking for her travel or telling the public um, uh, you know, more detail and context about, 
about where she's going to go and what she's going to do. That's really for the speaker to, to, to talk to. So the White House, just wrapping this up, hasn't uh, relayed any position uh, to the speaker uh, on this matter. I'm, I'm not going to talk about the, the conversations that, uh, that are being had with the speaker's office. I'm not going to get into the details of it. What I can tell you is our obligations, and we take them seriously, and the national security establishment is to make sure that as she prepares to travel, she does so fully informed with all the context analysis and information she needs to make the best decision. And again, I've seen no decision. We've seen no announcement. That is entirely for the speaker to determine. Okay, thank you. Admiral, uh, what about Russia? Thanks, guys. Uh, Russia is banning a Jewish agency. And then, uh, I'm sorry, guys. I got to go. I think I got everything, right? Russia, Russia, Thanks, guys. Thank you, John. All right. Thank, thanks, John. Thank you, John. Okay, I have a couple things for you at the top. Someone mentioned CHIPS, and today the Senate passed uh, CHIPS, the CHIPS and Science Act, with a strong bipartisan vote, which will lower costs and create good paying jobs here at home. We know that many families are worried about the state of the economy and the cost of living, and the CHIPS bill is one answer. It will accelerate the manufacturing of semiconductors in America, lowering gas price, lowering prices on everything from cars to dishwashers. It will strengthen our supply chains and national security because we will be able to make these critical technologies at home. Next, the bill will go over to the House, as you all know, for a vote, and then the President will sign it as soon as possible. As I mentioned earlier this week, we are closely monitoring the extreme heat conditions impacting millions of Americans. The President has directed his team to take swift and aggressive action to protect communities and last week announced $2.3 billion through FEMA to help communities increase resilience to heat waves, drought, wildfires, food, hurricanes, and other hazards. Federal officials are proactively inspecting over 70 high-risk industries in areas under a heat warning or advisory. Yesterday, we also launched heat.gov, a website that provides information and tools to assist federal, state, and local governments in responding to extreme heat. And today, we announce additional actions to lower elect electricity bills and maintain an affordable energy supply to cool homes. We're we're, we are paving the way to expand access to low-cost community solar power for 4.5 million families in HUD-assisted housing. We announced that five states and Washington, D.C. have signed up to pilot a new federal platform that will connect low-income households to low cost solar power, saving families a combined $1 billion uh, annually in electricity bill costs across the participating locations. We launched a new initiative to help small rural housing authorities making rental housing more energy efficient, resulting in savings that can be reinvested in lowering costs for rural families. We also announced new investments to strengthen America's solar work workforce by expanding union de de density and increasing participation from underserved and underrepresented groups in the rapidly growing solar industry. President Biden is taking bold action to tackle the climate crisis and protect Americans from threats like extreme heat, and he will continue to take uh, action. Uh, one last thing, and then we can get started today. The Treasury Department announced new steps that will make it even easier for state and local governments to use American, use American Rescue Plan funds to increase the supply of affordable housing in their communities. This builds on commitments made in President's Comprehensive Housing Supply, housing supply Action Plan to address housing shortages and lower costs for families. Tackling costs for families is President Biden's number one priority, and while the housing shortage in U.S. long pre preceded the pandemic, increasing the supply of affordable housing remains critical to lowering housing costs for families over time. American Rescue Plan funds have already been a key source of state and local investment in affordable housing, providing billions of dollars to help improve housing stability, preserve and develop new affordable housing, and helping homeowners stay in their homes. But today's steps will help leverage 
even more American Rescue Plan dollars to help close gap in the supply of affordable housing. So those are the announcements that I have for you. Will, you want to kick us off? Sure, thanks. Um, I've got two things. Uh, does the President's increased COVID testing cadence that Dr. O'Connor uh, mentioned mean that he's going to be tested daily for COVID, at least in the near term? So, what I can promise to you is that we will uh, be as transparent as we have been uh, this past couple of days in letting you know uh, when uh, the president uh, tests positive. Uh, we, we know there's been questions about a potential relapse. That is very, very a small percentage of that happens. Uh, but if that were to happen, we would share just like we have been every day with uh, the letter, uh, detailed letter from the president every day uh, with letting you know from, from that day on Thursday, we put out a statement, we put out a letter, uh, and we were uh, very, very transparent on what was happening with uh, the president's health. So if that were to occur, we would certainly be transparent on that. Nothing on the cadence specifically. No I, d I don't have any change of cadence, but I do. For, again, I w we will promise to be transparent and share uh, when he, uh, if if he were to, uh, if anything were to change. Again, small percentage of that happening uh, to change with his testing, uh, you know, uh, status. Okay, and one other thing on another topic. Um, what's behind the president invoking President Trump uh, more often in his remarks? He's been tweeting about it. He spoke about it in the, on, the, on the tape remarks yesterday. Is this part of a change in strategy to specifically name Trump? So as it relates to the, the uh, tape remarks that you're speaking about where he um, addressed uh, black law enforcement, which was the noble event that happened uh, on Monday, Look, you know, the president has spoken many times before about uh, his, pre his predecessor's role and the, and the responsibility uh, that his predecessor bears in, on January 6th. And, uh, you know, and I spoke to this yesterday as well. The president wanted to use that moment uh, to thank the heroes, the law enforcement heroes, uh, to thank them for their bravery and made a comparison, made a comparison to uh, what, what we saw this, this, his predecessor uh, Donald Trump do on that very day, which is instead of stand, standing uh, on the side of the law enforcement, uh, instead of, uh, of, of uh, standing on the side of democracy, he stood on the side of the mob. And so that is what the president wants to make very clear, is that we had, um, you know, we had law enforcement that day who were assaulted, who were beaten, who were, who were being attacked, uh, and uh, they protected our democracy. And uh, we had uh, someone who was in this very building, uh, as you got, all saw the reporting, 187 uh, minutes away, uh, minutes of the first couple of hours, those three hours, not far from where we stand here today, uh, and didn't do anything. And so that is what the president wants to make very clear. Um, so yeah, so just to follow up on the CHIPS Act bill, there was that provision in there that you all had advocated for that would let you basically block a deal if a company was going abroad and, say, investing in China, and you thought it was against national security interests. That got stripped out. Are you guys going to do that as an EO? So I'll, I'll say this. The, pres the, the bill is going to the House. Uh, so that is the next process uh, of the bill. We've been very clear about having guardrails. I think uh, the, uh, the speaker wrote a letter saying that, how important it is going to be uh, to have uh, those, uh, those safety precautions uh, in, in this CHIPS bill. Uh, look, this is going to, what, we, what we're seeing right now with the Senate has passed is going to be a game changer as we talk about inflation, as we talk about strengthening the supply chain. Uh, this is what this is, will do. Uh, when we talk about, uh, you know, when we look at the, the, those semiconductor chips, uh, that are in uh, that are in, for example, automobiles, and we saw how those costs spiked uh, over during the pandemic. Uh, this is going to help lower cost uh, for families. So you know, the it's going to continue into the house, uh, and so we'll see uh, what happens in the next step. I'm not going to uh, speak to hypotheticals at this point, but again, it still has another process that it needs to go through. Okay, now oh. let me ask you just a quick question on the economy. Um, so, uh, Fed Chair Jay Powell, um, after raising uh, rates again today. Um, he said in his press conference that um, the U.S. economy is not currently in a recession, but that the path to have a soft landing clearly has narrowed, which translate out of the jargon means that it's much more likely that we will have a recession as, these, um, as they continue to try to fight inflation in the future. 
Um, so is that the White House's assessment as well? And, and what would you do to kind of uh, make that less likely? So here's what he said. I'll, I'll quote him directly. I don't think the U.S. is currently in a recession. There's just too many areas in the economy that are performing well. And then he points to the labor market, uh, the very strong labor market that we that we know are are, are one of the factors that's looked uh, that uh, economists and, and experts look at. Uh, right now, we're seeing that strong labor market with uh, uh, about 400,000 jobs that have been created each month. Uh, we see unemployment at 3.6. There were there was the uh, state unemployment uh, uh, numbers that came out last week with 21 states that are at 6 percent or lower. Uh, and so the way that we see is that we are not currently in a recession or uh, a pre-recession. And look, we're going to let the Fed do its business. We're going to let them be continue to be independent. Uh, and that's what the president has said. They are, they are uh, uh, committed to making sure that uh, we lower uh, inflation or uh, tackle inflation for the American people. So we're going to let them do their job. They have the monetary policy uh, to do that. So I won't speak further uh, into exactly what they're doing and how, how that's going to look for them. You noted uh, we are not currently in a recession, you don't think, but are you concerned that these Fed rate hikes could push you into a recession? Look, we, uh, again, it is, uh, we're not going to comment on uh, the monetary policy um, uh, steps that the Federal Reserve is taking. Uh, they are an independent uh, agency, and we are going to give them the room uh, to do the, the job that they're doing. Uh, and so right now, the president has laid out his plan to, to lower inflation. We have seen what has happened with gas prices the last 43 days, uh, a steep decline, uh, the, the, you know, the, a steep decline that we haven't seen in a decade. Uh, again, to help give families a little bit of breathing room, uh, and that's what the, the president has talked about. Uh, we have also seen uh, food prices go down just a little bit, uh, and so we're going to continue to do that. We're going to there's the drug, uh, the drug, uh, 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 the drug prices bill, the reconciliation uh, legislation that's going to continue to address uh, lowering costs for Americans, and so that's going to be our focus there. We are hearing from companies like Walmart and Target who are starting to, to say that you know they're seeing how inflation is impacting their customers. And there are a lot of Americans who, even though you, you may say that you don't, we're not in a recession now, that's not how it feels to them. You know, what is your message to those consumers, those Americans, who very much feel that we yeah. are in a recession? And we have said this before. We understand what uh, what uh, the American people are going through. We 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 feel that. We understand that. That is something that the president personally understands. Uh, we see that the gas prices and the and uh, what they're dealing with at the pump uh, is, uh, is, is costing families. But again, the president for the past several months has taken action uh, to make sure that uh, we do everything that we can to give American families some relief. That's why he did the work uh, with the, st the Strategic Petroleum uh, Reserve. That's why he did uh, the announcement on the ethanol 15, something that's not normally done uh, during the summer. And he did that. Uh, so that we can bring some costs down. Even the Treasury Department announced yesterday that the actions that the president took uh, helped bring down the cost per gallon uh, by 40 cents. And so while uh, there's still more work to be done, but this will give this will give families a little breathing room. 70 cents on average uh, per gallon. That's gonna that's gonna give uh, families uh, with a two uh, two car families at least 70 bucks a month uh, to save. And so that matters. Now, is there still work to be done? Absolutely. The job doesn't stop. Uh, he's going to continue to see what else he can do. That's why we're looking at the, uh, the reconciliation piece as well, to bring down lower costs. And that's what chip, the CHIP bill is going to do. Okay, Caitlin. Um, I know you can't talk about the details of a prisoner swap, but is the president consulting with the Justice Department about all of this, given that it would involve a prisoner swap? So I can say this, again, we're not going to give the details. There's safety reasons. Kirby just laid out all of the, uh, the rationale of not having, about not negotiating and not going further than we are already. But look, the State Department is, is playing point on this. There is an, a special envoy uh, that deals with this issue specifically. Uh, and the President has been very, very clear from, from very, much, very early uh, in his administration that uh, he believes that uh, any U.S. national uh, that is wrongfully detained uh, should, be, uh, should be brought home, and he's going to do everything uh, to make sure that happens. So there's a new poll showing that 75 percent of Democratic voters want the party to nominate someone other than Joe Biden as the nominee. 
Um, what does the president make of that so dynamic? I mean, we're not worried about polls. Uh, the president has said, has been clear that he intends to run, but we are so far away uh, from that time, uh, from, uh, you know, even being close uh, uh, to, to be thinking about that. Uh, but what I can say is we're going to continue uh, to do the work that I just laid out that the president is doing, lowering costs. We're, we are, you know, we are, the, you saw the president's statement on chips. That is a great step forward uh, to investing in manufacturing, to uh, dealing with our national security, to lowering costs cost uh, for Americans. There's the reconciliation uh, 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 bill that's going to help lower cost. Uh, there, de there are definitely plans that we're going to continue uh, to work on. So we don't leave anybody behind. And so that's going to be his focus. And I, you know, I will say on the other side, the you got the MAGA uh, congressional Republicans who are putting forth plans uh, that's going to take away uh, sunset Medicare, sunset uh, Social Security, uh, ri uh, increase uh, taxes for Americans uh, making less than $100,000 a year. That is, that is what the plan is on the other side. At least this president has a plan, and he's doing the work on behalf of the American people. Great. Uh, great, but so as you talk about plans on the other side, mm -hmm. it was this president's plans that contributed to inflation, right? No, it was not. If, no. It was this president's plan. If we talk about the American Rescue Plan, look, Peter, when the president walked into this administration, there was an economic crisis, there was a COVID crisis, there was a climate change crisis, and we're still dealing uh, with a lot of that right now. But the president turned the economy back on. There were businesses that were closed, schools that were closed, and because of the American Rescue Plan, by the way, no Republican voted for that plan, and that plan had $350 billion for public safety, another thing that Republicans talk about, but they actually don't do, and they don't put, push forward on a policy that will help our law enforcement. That plan helped put us in a stronger labor market and help make our economy stronger. And so that is what is happening. It is not the president that has created inflation. There are also outside factors that has led us to where we are today. If things are going so great, though, then why is it the White House officials are trying to redefine recession? No, we're not redefining recession. If we all understand a recession to be two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth in a row, and then you have White House officials come up here to say, no, 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 that's not what a recession is. It's something else. How is that not redefining recession? Because that's not the definition. That is not the definition. Brian Deese said in 2008, of course, economists have a technical definition, which is of a recession, which is two consecutive quarters of negative growth. I can tell and you this. He said mm -hmm. two, consec two negative quarters of GDP growth is not the technical definition of a recession. It is what not. Changed? It is not. Why did he say that it, it was? It is not. I can, sp I can speak to I can speak to you to what he said t yesterday in front of all of you, which is the last thing that you just repeated. There are many factors. There are many factors, economic factors and indicators to consider. Uh, and I will say that uh, the textbook definition of recession is not is not two negative quarters of GDP. We have a strong labor market. We have business that's investing. We have consumers uh, that are also uh, very much, uh, you know, in, in investing and, and purchasing. That is incredibly <laughs> important. We have 3.6 unemployment. You do not see that in a pre-recession, and you do not see that in a recession. So the factors that we are seeing right now, the economic indicators, uh, does not, does not show that we're in recession. And I'll read, since you gave me some quotes, I'll give you some as well. In 2009, the St. Louis Fed said, while the popular definition of recession is two consecutive quarters of negative real gross domestic product GDP growth, the NBER, which we have mentioned many times in this room, does not strictly abide by this designation. Instead, the committee broadly defines a recession as a significant decline in economic activity spreading across the economy, lasting more than a few months. NBER has been around since 1920. I'm going to move on. Okay. Uh, to follow up on the economy, is it a risk for President Biden to say that he does not think the United States is going to be in a recession? And does the White House have any concerns that it will look misguided if the U.S. does enter a recession? So. Their second part is, 
you know, speculation right now, and, and if you're, the answer to your first part is no, uh, because we're looking at the facts. We're looking at the other economic indicators, uh, the strong labor market, uh, as I just listed out. We had 21 <coughs> states last, last week where we saw unemployment was at 3% or lower. Uh, so everything that we are seeing uh, currently right now does not show that we are in a recession. And that is just th the facts. And it's not just us saying that. You have economic experts who have said this. I just laid out a couple of, uh, a, a couple of, um, uh, of uh, you know, uh, uh, outlets who have said this as well. Uh, and so there is not, and I'm, I'm happy to list more economic uh, folks who have said this as well. Um, so, you know, Citigroup's Jane Frazier, little of the data I see tells me the U.S. is on the cusp of a recession. Moody's Analytics, Mark Zandi, I still have no recession in my, in my forecast. And job numbers are, <coughs> are, are, are growing with, are, are, with, are incongruous with fears that recession is dead ahead. And so that matters, too. So it's not just us saying this. There are other experts as well who have weighed in on this. And just ahead of tomorrow, given there is so much talk about is there is there not a recession, I asked this the other day, I just want to follow up. Is there a White House definition of what a recession looks like? We've, we have, we have, um, uh, have talked about the the, um, uh, the National Bureau of Economic Research. Uh, they have the textbook definition of what that looks like. They look at it more broadly, as I just laid out. Uh, and so that's what we would point you to. Uh, we've been sitting here. Senator Manchin has put out a statement saying that he has a, a, an agreement of some kind with Senator Schumer on an uh, Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 that at first blush, forgive me, I haven't read uh, the full details, looks a lot like something that might raise hopes of a reconciliation deal. Uh, do you have any comments on the White House on whether you've been involved in these talks, and is this a deal on a reconciliation package? So, uh, I'm standing here, I haven't seen this for myself, I need to talk to our, our folks on this, so I don't want to get ahead uh, of the team here. Uh, but we have been very clear about uh, the reconciliation bill. We have always said this is uh, this is negotiations that are happening in Congress, uh, but uh, clearly we are we are we are you know we welcome hearing about the drug, uh, the lowering uh, cost of pharmaceutical drugs, which is going to help so many seniors, which is so incredibly important. Uh, this is something that the president has been uh, fighting for since he was senator. Uh, when it comes to fighting uh, big pharma, uh, you know, fighting uh, pharmaceuticals who would not uh, uh, let Medicare uh, negotiate lower lower cost. This matters. This is going to matter to so many millions of Americans who are dealing, uh, many with uh, chronic illness, as you think about our seniors. So this is something that we have spoken to. We do believe that it's going to be part of lowering inflation, which is so important, again, as we talk about the economy. I, I don't want to get ahead of the team on this. Uh, I, I have not seen uh, the announcement. Uh, but again, we have been uh, very supportive of, of that that of those pieces of the reconciliation bill. There's no you know, recent conversations that you can tell us there's about no, with Senator Manchin and yeah, members of the Yeah, there's no, there's no conversation that I can read out to you. Okay. Thank okay. you. I want to ask you a question about monkeypox response. Uh, there is a, an antiviral treatment that is effective that is in the U.S. stockpile. It's called T-pox, and it works to uh, see lesions go away. Uh, apparently, it's very hard to get. Uh, mm -hmm. Patients have to uh, have their doctors email the CDC on a one-on-one -on -one basis, and it has to be approved case by case. Why has, and that, that raises questions about equities, people who might be their own best advocates, have doctors who get engaged, might be able to get access to the medication, but others might not. Why has the White House not reached down and tried to make this medicine, which the U.S. has, easier to access? So here's what I can tell you. I don't know much about this medicine uh, that you are speaking of, uh, Stephen, but I can tell you that uh, when we learned, so I think the first case was in May at some time, and in June we put together, the HHS put together a comprehensive, comprehensive strategic approach on dealing with mon monkeypox. Uh, we made sure that it was also very ag aggressive. Uh, we made sure that there were more than 300,000 vaccines across the country. At the t I think currently right now there's about 3,000 cases, and uh, and so we expedited that. Uh, we ordered a production of an extra 5 million uh, more vaccines. Vaccines. And today, just to 
just to add to, to that, uh, today the FDA approved 786,000 doses of the monkeypox vaccine manufactured by Bavar Bavarian Nordic. I'm not sure, maybe this is part of what you're speaking of. We would just have to dig in a little bit to see. But this is an important step forward in our plans to accelerate uh, and strengthen our monkeypox response. And HHS is going to continue to work uh, to strengthen the response in the coming days and work with partners on the ground, in the community, and across the world to combat uh, this virus. And we have been uh, making sure that uh, as the vaccines go out, uh, they go to at-risk communities, uh, and that there's also an education component that has to be done uh, as well, which is really important because people are not aware of what monkeypox is. Uh, that is something that HHS uh, has been doing as well. Great. Go ahead. Um, just want to go back on some of the economic messaging. There's been a lot of debate uh, over the technical term of recession, and this somewhat harkens back to earlier economic messaging that you guys had around inflation, where you insisted that it was transitory for months, then it was temporary, um, and then we've seen it continue to persist. And I'm wondering if you can just take us in a little bit about how you think about economic messaging, particularly uh, as it relates to the recession. The argument over whether we are or not in a recession, uh, I think when we talk to Americans, sort of misses the point of about the economic uh, uh, attitude and, and feeling that they have um, and the struggles that they face with increased prices uh, across the board, as we've seen over the, the many months. And I'm wondering if the White House finds it effective to debate the technical term of recession versus speak more broadly to Americans, who it doesn't really matter whether a group of economists that they've never heard of declare a recession when it when it comes to their, you know, just getting by. No, and I get your point. And, and to, to some degree, I agree, right? There are, there are Americans here who are are feeling uh, who are feeling the the high prices and the cost uh, very you know very personally uh, and that is something that the president I believe has talked about uh, almost any time that he talks about the economy he talks about the pain that the American people are feeling and he talks about his plan and what he is going to do to lower cost uh, that's why we bring up gas prices because we have seen uh, costs grow down we understand that we need to do more and we will uh, we'll continue to do more by asking oil companies to make sure they uh, the profit that they're making passed on uh, to the consumer. Uh, so we should see more uh, going to the consumer as prices are going down. We just, I was just asked about the reconciliation bill. That is something that is incredibly important as we lower uh, drug prices. And so there is, uh, you know, a myriad of ways uh, that we are working on to make sure that we have a plan and that cost uh, is lowered. Uh, but as we are being asked about recession, as we are being asked uh, if we are in one or if we're going to one, we're what we're doing is just laying out the facts. Uh, you know, I have a long list of, of other uh, organizations, other economic uh, groups uh, that have said we are not in a recession, and because of the strong labor market, uh, you know, it, it, there is no uh, there is no indicator, or all these different indicators doesn't show that we're headed into a recession. So we're just laying out the facts. Uh, as as we are seeing it, and we're also pointing to NBER, who act who actually has the textbook uh, definition, and they look at this more broadly, as I've said. But you know, we're going to continue to to talk about the American people. We're going to continue to talk about what they're feeling. Uh, you know, that's why the chips is so important, as I just mentioned very early on at the top. And so we're, that doesn't end. That doesn't end. The pres the president does this every time we have a conversation about the economy or is asked. <laughs> You're setting the expectation that we're not headed to a recession, we're not in a recession. What happens if the NBER does declare we're in a recession? Do well, that's, you a, that's a hypothetical. I'm not going to get into that. I'm just saying the, the, where we are currently, how we see things, uh, how the, the multiple economic indicators that are in front of us uh, do not play in a way uh, where we would be a, a currently in a recession at this time. Just lastly, not very quickly, does the president have confidence in his economic team's ability to forecast and predict? Obviously, on the inflation, that was something that we heard from the whole host of the same economic officials we're hearing now, uh, that we, the inflation was temporary, it was transitory, it would not persist, and, and that's been the opposite. They're now saying the same thing about recession. I'm just curious. So the president has full confidence in his economic team. Go ahead, Peter. Has the president 
communicated one way or another to the House Speaker Nancy Pelosi whether he thinks it's a good idea for her to go to Taiwan or had any conversation about that topic with her? I, I, I don't have a, uh, a, a call to, to preview for you at this time or that's been on his schedule. Uh, he has spoken to members of Congress, as we mentioned last week. Uh, those were the one of the many things that he did while he was uh, uh, working from the White House residence. I don't have anything new to share on, on the a particular House, call. Specificity to her. Does the White House have any concerns about a, a prominent American officials going, given the sensitivities of the relationship between the U.S. You know, and I'll just re I'll just reiterate what we have said from here uh, is that any time a member of Congress travels, we do share uh, with them the geopolitical uh, kind of information that's happening in the country, in the region, uh, the national, national security situation. And the, it doesn't matter if it's Taiwan or any other place around the world. Uh, we share that information. Uh, and so we make very clear uh, of what is happening uh, currently in that well, moment. You communicated earlier that the White House had identified 17 close contacts of the president. Um, just for clarity, as we hopefully wrap up the president's experience with COVID, can you say either way whether any of those 17 individuals, without identifying by them by name, have since tested positive? For they have not. Not one of the 17? They have not tested positive. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, I'll take one more. Tam? Uh, now that the president is uh, feeling better, uh, are there any plans for him to get out and travel and talk to the American people about these economic concerns uh, that you say he cares about? As you know, he's always uh, uh, He's always willing and thrilled and excited to go out and, and talk to the American people, have those one-on-ones that you see him have when he is at the rope line or when he is engaging uh, with the American public. So he certainly is looking forward to getting back on the road. Uh, as far as uh, a, a schedule, any travel, upcoming travel, uh, no, nothing to add, nothing to share at this time on any addition to his travels in the next coming days. All right, thanks. thanks. I'll be back tomorrow, guys. We'll be back tomorrow. Thanks, everybody.